Professor Washington did the second in-person colloquium of the last two years, or two and a half years, whatever that is. Um, and, and so uh, uh, the, David is going to be talking about G minus 2, which is some uh, really remarkable experiment that was done, I guess, for the first time in the 60s at CERN, and then was repeated several times with ever increasing sensitivity at Brookhaven, and most recently at Fermilab, which is actually what David is going to be talking about. And in fact, this was the new result from G minus 2 that was supposedly supposed to be discussed by David here a year and a half ago, and that was called off <laughs> by COVID. So by now, it's not such a new result anymore, but nevertheless, it's the first time we hear about it from David, so it is the new result uh, by definition. Um, so David is at the University of Washington, and, 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 and he's a fellow of the ATS and a Guggenheim fellow. He has also discovered a number, large number of teaching awards, both from the US of Illinois, where he used to be, and from the US of Washington, where he is now. Um, and I think, uh, you know, and he's spokesperson of the new G minus two uh, experiment. And David, take it away. Oh, thanks. It's just remarkable to even think about giving a talk in front of human beings. And uh, I had more fun today visiting a handful of you, seeing labs again, feeling like I was back in the saddle again, so to speak. Maybe you haven't had so many talks yet yourselves. And you know, maybe it will also be a different experience for you. This, we're not a large group of people. Feel free to shout out and so on if you have things that uh, are of interest to you as we go. It's a complicated experiment. I'll try to give you a nice fl overview flavor of what we were up to and try to answer specific things. So, you know, one of the things is, woohoo! <laughs> we're in person for once. <laughs> Even with masks, it's okay, I think. I'm going to tell you this story. It's actually a six month old story, Georgia, not a year and a half, so it's not so bad. And I was the founding spokesperson of this experiment up through this data set, and I was the analysis coordinator of this, uh, but there's, the spokesmanship's changed, and I don't want to think I'm running this experiment right now. There's other people. So let me just start off very generally speaking, uh, colloquium style for a moment. You know, we all know the standard model of particle physics uh, represents a great uh, human achievement, right? And we see these beautiful pictures like that. Why is this true? We know all the particles. We know the bits and pieces. We know the forces. Uh, we know what we call the rules of engagement between these particles. And you know, what's, what's not to love when you think about it? When you step back, what's not to love about this thing? But we also always hear rumbling for years and years, the standard model is somehow incomplete. So after this wonderful accolades about the model, immediately people start to say bad things. And it seems like it's just taking you know, forever to figure out what this is. And so what happens is our theory friends are developing creative what we call new physics models, somehow extensions, fixes to the standard model. And what are they fixing? Well, they're fixing the fact that they does, doesn't deal with dark matter, or there's a hierarchy problem you hear about, or there's no gravity involved in this in a proper way, and there's a matter-antimatter -matter asymmetry, the very reason that we're here is not explained. Or maybe they're just proposing some kind of new thing that we haven't ruled out that sounds kind of fun, like dark photons, or that the fundamental constants are time changing, like the fine structure constant perhaps, or maybe there's extra dimensions, things we might not even be able to check but might not be ruled out because we can't check them. And as experimentalists, I view us, I view us as basically detectives. So I look at these detective shows and we're trying to solve a crime, right? We're trying to find smoking gun evidence that could either rule out these suggestions that are being made or promote them up. And ruling out, just like in a crime scene, going around and finding out things are okay is also a very, very important contribution that most of us in experimental physics end up making. We say there's zero here, it's not there, we don't see it there, and so on. And that's not bad. People should not feel bad about that. Of course, a positive result might indicate something new. And the fun thing about this story today is I'm going to tell you a positive result story as opposed to a rule out story. So you don't have to go away today thinking I'm going to tell you about a limit. So how do experimentalists go about this detective search work in the world of particle physics? And I like to uh, uh, think about it this way. Usually, usually the tools of the trade are to smash particles together very violently 
right, smash them together very violently to reach high mass scales directly, to produce the, the scales that are not reachable in the lab so easily, and to be general. So they build these detectors which are extremely general, not exactly knowing exactly what they're going to look for, but being able to look for any and every creative thing that you might want to observe after the collisions have occurred. And this is a tool which has gone on for many generations of high energy physics research and it's been very successful. That's why it keeps going on. And the latest, of course, was, was the Higgs. And there's a, a beautiful event display of, the, of a Higgs event in, in one of the LHC detectors where the particles come in and out goes very high energy red tracks you see there. And these things make these kind of cartoons like this, um, which is also fun because the public really enjoys sort of seeing these things as well. So, arguably this Higgs, though, that was discovered completes the standard model. We have not found something wonderful there that is beyond the standard model. It's the last little piece of it. And so, what tools do we use to search beyond that model? And so, this is sort of a metaphor that I like to use. I stripped it down a little bit for you, but this is a famous castle which was in history has never been breached because the standard model castle here today but it was attacked many 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 times over the history and was never knocked down so if you think about the way we approach this we first built the LHC at about seven or eight TeV or so and nothing happened and then we then we upgraded it and now we have the high luminosity LHC and the way to look for a crack in the standard model is to blast the heck out of it like this, bang, 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 and hopefully by shaking this like this, you might be able to crack open, find some kind of difference in an expectation of a cross section or a bump or so, and that's the method. Where is the castle? Please? Where is the castle? Ah, it's, just, it's off the coast of India. I'll get back. The other way to do this, though, the other way to go into that castle is through tunneling. So, and this is a true story as well. You can imagine quantum mechanic tunneling go breaking into the castle, not by knocking the walls down, but coming in from below. And that's sort of the indirect approach, which a lot of experiments that I'll mention in the next slide use. Uh, and the interesting story about this, Giorgio, is after I, I had a longer version of this I used to use. And the real story is, it was attacked many, many times like the big cannon. And I thought, fine, it never got breached. But then I learned that it was also attempted by the quantum mechanic one. And that also failed, which is really sad. So I don't tell that story usually. <laughs> okay, the indirect, appro indirect approach uses precision, intensity, and sensitivity frontiers. So there's a collection of images here, some eye candy for you from different laboratories with Neutron, EDM, at SNS. There's various experiments at the Paul Scher Institute. There's uh, uh, experiments, Lux experiment, like dark matter that you guys know. There's a Mercury EDM experiments. There's Jefferson Lab. There's all these ADMX experiments and so on and so on. So what are they doing? Each one of these is usually custom designed to check something very specific. So for example, is lepton number conserved? This is mu to E gamma or mu to 2E or mu to 3E. This is a, whether a, a muon can turn into an electron directly. The origin of matter and antimatter asymmetries in the universe through electric dipole moments of neutrons and atoms and so on, or through neutrino double beta, neutrinos double beta decay. The ones in red here, I, I knew there was a, an association here with Stanford. So WIMP dark matter searches or axion dark matter searches like that. And then are there deviations from standard model predictions like the G minus two of the muon or the parity violating electron scattering where you're looking for the running of the weak charge or uh, the test of unitarity of the CKM matrix, uh, unitarity matrix. So, and then there's lots of atomic physics experiments which I couldn't even hope to pretend. So for about 20 years now, there's one measurement that's been standing out as being very inconsistent with the standard model and unresolved. And that is this measurement here of G minus two from the Brookhaven experiment versus the theory which is in the red, the red band here. And what, I, what you see in blue here is updates of the standard model theory. And so this is the most recent one from 2020. Where this isn't all new, this is an accumulation of, of, of information that gets refined along the way. And for a long time, it's been about three standard deviations between this uh, green bar and this pink bar here. And you could blame the experiment. There's just one experiment there, after all. It's, it looks like it's a long-standing thing, but it's long-standing against one measurement. So, Or you can blame the theory. And people uh, have both uh, certainly tried to look into both of those. 
So what is that quantity? That quantity, the muon's anomalous magnetic dipole moment is, a, here it's defined, a mu is equal to g, g, the gyromagnetic ratio, g minus two over two. I'll come back to that and show you why that's the case in a moment. And basically to remind you, this is a magnetic moment and a spin of a particle and it has the gyromagnetic ratio factor here, g. And if this was a point-like spin one-half particle, or Dirac particle, it would be exactly equal to two, 2.000 2 in, the, in the simplest words from 100 years ago or so. But we know that there are large deviations from uh, g equals to two. For example, none of the nucleons have anything close to two and the neutron has a big magnetic moment. And those are based on the fact that they have things like internal structure here. So there's a lot of charges running around in there and they have what's called an anomalous magnetic moment, ind indicative of structure. The other way to think about for a point-like particle is these kind of Feynman diagrams where they interact with the vacuum. So these internal structures are here and these are virtual, these are, these are anomalous contribution to the magnetic moment from virtual loops that encapsulate all kinds of interactions with external fields. So when we do a G minus two experiment test, we're comparing a measurement of a precise calculation of these kind of diagram processes I'll show you in a moment uh, against a measurement to see if the standard model is in fact complete. So the question next is, well, how, how well does the standard model predict this quantity? Like, where are we in that number? So if I just break down the uh, G factor, and this is big, this is the G that should be two if nothing else was going on, then right away that you see that it, uh, it, this experiment is just sort of a older one, the theoretical number is 2.002331 right now, what, and it goes more than this. But this is just from this diagram that uh, Schwinger recognized in the late 40s, the so-called uh, Feynman diagram of the uh, Schwinger term, it's even called, it's, it's, it's actually equal to alpha over two pi. It's even on his gravestone. So it's alpha over two pi on, on Schwinger's gravestone. And that contribution is this number. This is this one part in about 850 correction from the, the virtual exchange of a photon. So you're gonna see a line like that, that's a muon in a magnetic field, that's what the little tadpole blue is uh, in yellow there, and you're seeing a radiative uh, correction. So it gets more complicated than that. Through the decades, one has figured out higher and higher order quantum electrodynamic corrections, and as of a couple of years ago, the picture on the right represents the end of 12,500 calculated diagrams to fifth order, which gives you digits way beyond what we would ever need for this experiment. They're very useful for the electrons, G minus two, but it's much more precise than, than we need here. The next thing that comes along as you work your way into the precision digits is if you imagine the same diagram that you have here, and you might remember this, this radiated photon can make an E plus E minus pair, it's called a vacuum polarization insertion. And now instead of putting an E plus E minus bubble in there, put a pi plus pi minus. It has the vector components of a photon there. And that's what this mess is here in the blob. And that blob you can't calculate. So as soon as you get to that point, you say, oh, it's, it's now it's a hadronic thing. I can't do the perturbative calculation that allowed me to calculate that diagram. So that has to come from a different source. And that comes from a recipe which is well known for many, many, many decades, which is a data-driven recipe. And the data-driven recipe says you can get this number out of integrating all of the E plus E minus to the various hadron. All of these are different E plus E minus cross sections. Measuring them absolutely, integrate this thing along the thing here. It's the, the ratio to muons is what's plotted here. But it's the top of the whole thing here. Integrate that all up and, and multiply it by a mathematical kernel, which is well known, and you get this number pretty well. So the next thing is you could say, all right, what, what else is next? Going down more digits. Well, you can replace any one of these electroweak, uh, uh, any one of these photons here with the electroweak equivalent of a, of a Z. And so if you do that, of course the Z is very heavy, so the effect is very small, but that's well known. So it's known better than we could ever need it, and it's known to second order, even third order. And then if you keep going, if you keep measuring down and down in more and more precision, you begin to run out of things in the standard model that you could check at that level. And now if you have a deviation, you don't know if you're now touching something new that's not in the collection of the things I was talking about. And that's the game that's in town. So what did we do? Okay, uh, well, first of all, who does that? The, there is a, a, a so-called G minus two theory initiative. I was asked about this today. There's about I mean, 50, 100 people or so on this uh, physics uh, report which came out in 2020, 
over the last bunch of years, knowing our experiment was being built, they decided rather than piecemeal through the literature, a random paper or another, to work collectively and produce all of the information in a coherent way that could be a reference number. So they will produce numbers from time to time, just like we were producing numbers from time to time, against which uh, one can do that. And that's the number that's down here. And the nice thing about this, one of the major breakthroughs since the last time, is this particular complicated diagram called hadronic light by light, which many people had blamed as being the possibility of the Brookhaven experiment not equaling theory, has been figured out how to do by data. And a long time ago, when, when we did the Brookhaven experiment, there were just little hadronic models that guessed at this diagram in, a, in a, an intelligent way. It turned out that they guessed it correctly because this data-driven way confirmed it very, very nicely, as did the lattice. And lots of, lots of people were involved there. That's one of my friends that's there. So the standard model, this is a number, you don't need to know too many numbers, but in terms of uncertainty, 358 part per billion is the current uncertainty on the theory. So what did we do? In April of this year, we measured the G factor of the muon to be this number that I've printed here. There's a lot of digits there, so don't memorize them or anything. That makes good passwords, but I can't memorize this either. You know, so my, you won't get into my bank account with that. The piece that I've cut out here in the bracket, this is the part that's different from two. Right? This is, this is now, we're now down to very elementary math. Okay, so that's the part that's g minus two. And then if you take that and divide it by two, then you got g minus two over two, and that's the anomaly part. So this is where this number comes from that has this particular precision. The uncertainty that, that we had in our first measurement is 460 part per billion, but when we combined it with the Brookhaven experiment, the two together are 350 part per billion, and so it's, you can see right now 350, 358, they're the same number. So theory and experiment are, are about the same right now. So in April, well, I'm very proud of this because I orchestrated this crazy idea of publishing everything that we knew about the experiment on one day. And so four papers came out in one day, uh, very nicely, thanks to the editors of uh, Phys Physical Review. We had the major announcement paper in PRL. It's a pretty long one. We had the muon precession paper in PRD. We had the magnetic uh, field measurement in terms of the proton uh, precession frequency in PRA. And we had a very complicated corrections from beam dynamics in PRAB. So there, if there's more than 100 pages or so for you to read if you are so intrigued by that. But I wanted the, the idea is I wanted to document everything because the measurement was going to be scrutinized. So the story behind this thing now is here's a group of us at our campus and it's an interesting collaboration that includes literally people from so many different subfields of physics. We have atomic physicist, nuclear, particle, optical, accelerator and theoretical physicists. We have big optical tables too, Giorgio. You would be impressed by the optical table picture that we've got. It doesn't have as many fancy lenses that you have, but it's, it's big. And all of these people have to be uh, coaxed into measuring one and only one outcome, one and only one outcome. So it's, it basically is uh, a goal of about 140 part per billion. So the fundamental experimental principle is known for a very long time. It's been done a number of times. And th I like this because this, I drew this picture probably 25 years ago and I keep it in my slides just because I, it kind of has a, like a nostalgic look to me and it's not too fancy. But this is the ring right now. So the idea is basically if you could imagine that you bring in a muon beam that's polarized and that would be the red vector in this uh, little diagram of the quarter of the ring. And it's going in the direction of, the moment, of its momentum, the black vector. So the black vector is going to go all the way around in a magnet. This magnet is a pure dipole field, so just remember a, a particle is going to go around in a circle very happily like that. And now the, if you look at the difference between the red vector, which is the spin, and the black vector, which is the momentum, you see that the, the red vector is slowly advancing. It's going around a little bit farther, a little bit faster than the other one. So as this muon goes around and around like this, the spin vector is advancing. And every 29 times the particle goes around, the red vector, I can't do that with my arm, comes back and catches it. So that's sort of the difference. So that it's that difference frequency, which is in the expression there, the spin precession frequency is S, that's the red vector. The cyclotron frequency is the C, that's the running around speed. And the anomalous precession frequency is that difference. So that's, that's the thing that's gonna happen. And notice that if you measured that frequency on the left, and if you measured the magnetic field B 
in that, in that magnet, then you're going to get the anomalous magnetic moment by just straight long division. So you want two numbers and do long division to get it out. Which is, so if you're going to do a precision measure, it has to be clean like that and very simple. Okay, it's not that simple because you could never put a charged particle beam inside a magnet and let it run around happily all by itself. It would go around a half a turn or three or four turns and it would have a vertical divergence to it at some point and smack into uh, the magnet and that would be that. So you have to do something to keep it in there. So you put in an electric field. You don't want to put another magnet field, magnetic field because you measure, work really hard on that magnetic field. So if you put in an a electric field, that will make some vertical containment, but a couple things happen. The up and down motion of the beam a little bit introduces something we call a pitch correction. Because imagine you're going up and down with respect to a vertical field. So it's not quite the same field. And the other thing is there's a, uh, if you go through an electric field, I'll show you a picture of this quite near the end, but there's basically an effect from the electric field which as a relativistic particle going transverse through this electric field, there's a motional magnetic field and it looks like a little bit of a magnet field. But what they discovered at CERN, the third CERN experiment in the mid-70s, was if you ran at the momentum of 3.094 GeV over C, then this relativistic gamma factor here, squared minus one, is equal to this term and the coefficient goes away. So it's a first order, this term drops out if you run right at that momentum. There's a little correction for not being at that momentum, but it drops out. So there's four miracles that permit one to measure G minus two to this kind of crazy precision. The first is, you did, nobody would ask this, but where do you get these polarized muon beams? You know, polarized beams in physics are not usually easy to get. And the answer is you get it for free because you get them from pions which are naturally producing back-to-back -back decays as you see in the diagram there with helicity conservation produces a muon which is polarized and so we end up with about a 97 percent polarized muon beam in the direction of motion so that comes for free. The second is that that factor was the, the because we're looking at the difference between the spin frequency and the cyclotron frequency we're actually measuring G minus 2 and not G that saves you a factor of 850 in the digits of the 2.002 the two stuff. And then the magic momentum idea was the breakthrough that they had in the 70s that allowed you to actually contain the beam. And the last thing I haven't mentioned yet is how do you know where the spin is actually? Where, what is the polarimetry that tells you where the spin of that muon is? And that comes again for free because the muon decay is is parity violating. And it's parity violating in a way that encodes, encodes the anomalous precession frequency directly into a measurement of the, uh, and directly into an energy spectrum oscillation, which you see in sort of a wiggle plot here if you have detectors that, that are measuring particles of a certain energy. So in the end of the day, it's a little fancier. Everything's always a little fancier, but AMU is obtained just by two frequency measurements that we make. So these were the two I said. This was the anomalous precession frequency, and this fancy thing I'll come back to here is a fancy way of saying what the magnetic field is that the muons have seen. And then there are a bunch of constants there to convert this to a correct unit, and those constants are measured by other people, and they're known well enough. So they're known more than well enough for us to grab those from co-data groups. And you can see even here that the G of the electron is in there and some other things like mass ratios of muon, muons to electrons and so on. So how do you get these beams? The reason, here's, so one of the groups of people in our experiment have to be beam physicists and I mean card carrying people that are theoretical beam physicists and practical people that, uh, that work in the accelerator and it starts like this. They, they bring at Fermilab bunches of big bunches of HGEV protons into this, uh, into this recycler ring then they use RF techniques to break them into four batches, they call them. The batches, you see this one batch came, came along this railroad track here, a few hundred meters, smacked into what used to be the old anti-proton target from the Tevatron. At that point, it produces pions of 3.1 GeV. They go for a few hundred meters where they're slowly decaying. Then they pop them into this ring. We run it around the ring three times because it, then all the pions decay away and protons which come along are coming along so slightly slower and they fall away after the, they become on the other side of the ring. Then we kick the thing into the storage ring right here and the only thing that gets into the ring is muons and a whole bunch of background positrons which isn't very pleasant. And later we may flip the polarity. I thought I'd just mention that. So 
this is just a little technical walkthrough, so it's kind of a fun thing. The beam then comes in the house here through these count through these last uh, quadrupole magnets. Uh, it goes through a series of detectors we built, which is all kinds of things that tell us when it's happening, what shape it looks like. And then if you try to put them into the ring of the magnet, they would never, they would never go around because they would go around in such a perfect circle, they go around and hit the very door that they come in. So half, a quarter of the way around, you have to kick them. You have to kick them sort of outward. And that's what's done here with a big electromagnet that's done with a big fancy pulse. And that's basically what's, what's shown here. And you, say, you basically, the first time around, make a sharp magnetic pulse and then you remove it. This is so hard to do. So tech, this is a huge technical challenge because to go around the ring once is 150 nanoseconds. You make a huge field on and off in that amount of time and that's all, obviously you know your E&M. That's pretty tricky. So I told you that we had to have these electric plates to keep things in. We make what's called a penning trap out of this thing. And you can see up here where my mouse is, there are quadrupole plates everywhere where the yellow things are painted. Imagine that these go the whole way like that. And they do a good job. You have a positive voltage on the top and bottom plates. So anytime a positive particle goes up, it's kicked down and so on and so forth. The problem was in the first run, I'm showing you now the la dirty laundry. Everybody focus on the dirty laundry. You're supposed to charge these plates up like this and have them be dead flat. But two of, the, two of 32 of the plates had some bad resistors connected we never knew about. And instead of charging up and being flat, they charged up very, very slowly, took their time, and didn't come up to full voltage. That cost us a year and a half. That's why I couldn't give you that colloquium a year and a half ago uh, down here, because we were looking at this thing to figure out what did this just do to our experiment. And it was bad. Here's a tour. Imagine you're a muon. You're driving around the ring. This is what you would see. You're inside the vacuum. You're seeing plates. You're seeing detectors as you're going to go by in a minute. There's detectors, more plates, gaps, lots of stuff. So there's rails in there. There's a, uh, a whole trolley that's going to drive around in there from time to time. And this is what you would see if you were able to visualize where those muons are. This is actually a measurement. We're able to measure this. So this circle represents something exactly this big. This is this, what we call the storage volume. And the beam is now moving back and forth because of betatron motions. It's, it's actually a sort of a weak focusing storage ring. And it has these electric fields and it's moving back and forth. So in the end of the day, it's time average to look like this thing on the right which is kind of looks like an avocado. So we call this an avocado plot, right? Opened up like that. And notice it's not centered. That's another problem. The kicker was not until the third year able to push the center of this avocado nut to the center where it's supposed to be. And that makes for a bigger correction for things. Okay, then the next thing is, uh, and this is kind of eye candy. If you want to watch a detector be built, here's one of my grad students putting one of many of these together while we talk. And all the way around in the inside of the ring are are basically 24 electromagnetic calorimeters, which are s pictured here. Basically, I'll show you another picture later. They're lead fluoride crystals, very, very fast. And all the way around the ring, up and down, are 378 NMR probes. We also built those at UW. And those are monitoring the magnetic field all the time, 24-7, they're running. So the precession frequency, this was the, remember, the, the wiggly thing that I did with my arms walking around like that is measured as follows. And it, as the beam goes around, if you're a detector, one, one of these 24 detectors, that would look like this. This is a detector station. If a muon decays, because the, the electron will, the positron will have a lower momentum in a constant magnetic field, it will curl to the inside. It'll smack into a detector like this. This is what these crystals look like. It'll go in here and make an electromagnetic shower. We will digitize it with a high fidelity. So we have a picture of that have a picture of that pulse. If it has a high enough energy, then we're going to store it. And this is a little plot which is sort of interesting. This is the energy of, of a positron from, from its lowest energy to its highest energy. And this is the number you get as a function of those two arrows again. So when the arrows are lined up, you'll see that you get a lot of high energy ones. You see that swelling. And when the arrows are opposite like that, you get fewer. So what you're plotting is just the, the ebb and flow of the number of the high energy events as a function of time. Does that make sense? 
So then you start the run, and this is what happens in a few seconds. You collect those events, and this is like a real event. And within a couple of seconds, you get this. Now you have to just do this until you get like uh, 10 to the 10 to the 10 or 10 to the 11th of these. So how about the magnetic field? Well, it started off with this, uh, it really was a rainy day. It, uh, the magnet went all the way around the country, uh, through the, through the, down the ocean, down the Atlantic Ocean, around Florida, up through the rivers, drove three nights, closed the highways, and arrived to a pretty big celebration, and then we had to rebuild it. And uh, as we rebuilt that, it, take about, it took about a year to put all this together. And then you have to turn it into a magnet. After it's built, all the steel is built and everything is built, you have to turn it into a magnet. And the way you know what it's doing is you want the magnetic field right here in this, this is again this little nine centimeter region, this red circle in the middle of a big dipole magnet. And the pictures you're seeing here represent the free induction decay of a proton NMR. So you take the protons, you knock them over in the field, they're spinning around with the Larmor frequency, and then they align back up. That's the free induction decay signal. If you have a very uniform field, you get a picture like this. If you have a non-uniform field, it's, you've got multiple, multiple precession frequencies for the batch of protons that are in the sample. And so the, what we do is we built a trolley with, with, in this particular case, there's 25 NMR probes on the front of a trolley and we're driving this thing around as we're shimming this magnet. And it's kind of fun to watch because if you watch each one of these free induction decays as the trolley's driving around, you can see there are regions that are pretty lousy. And we're doing this as we slowly shim the magnet into uniform standards. So this, after many steps, took about a year, but in the last steps, after we did everything that Brookhaven people did, the uniform, this is zero to 360 degrees, and this is the uncertainty in the magnetic field, the variation. And the red is us, and the blue is Brookhaven, it's about the same. So then we invented a technique where we used five, something like 8,000 tiny laminated pieces of iron to custom tune the beam locally. And then we ended up with this, which is sort of fun to watch. As these things got glued inside the poles of the magnet, they suddenly completely changed the quality of the field. And so the red is also, so we ended up making a field which is three times more uniform than Brookhead, which is very important. It goes right into all the systematic errors. Okay, so then let's talk about the data set for run one. And this, this phrase is always good. Everyone always likes to say in precision physics, to trust is good, but not to trust is better. And maybe you can say this in Italian for us. Uh, your turn. There you go. <laughs> well, how do you do that? Well, you have multiple analysis teams doing things, many calibrations, alignments. I mean, it's just, it's a tedious, tedious life to go through this, but you have to do this work, okay? So, now I apologize for this expression right here, but it, it is not, a, I don't, I hate little expressions in Colloquium, but this is not a, a mathematical expression. This is long division. So it's not going to be anything hard. The numerator is going to be one thing and the denominator is another. It allows me, the way we, I put this in the FizzRev letter exactly this way, so that we could talk about the subjects that people contributed to. If you contributed this and you contributed that, you're in this expression. So what are these things? Well, we have a blinded clock, which I'll mention. The omega A with the M means this is what we measure. When the detectors measure this wiggle frequency, we, we measure this frequency. But it is not the right frequency. It is the one we measure. And the terms that follow here are all corrections to that, which I'll show you what they're for and, and why we know what they are. And that gives us, so that's basically this wiggle. We call it, this is officially called a wiggle histogram. I don't know where the, we started this decades ago and the word is too clever and it's, that's what it's called. So this histogram you measure and then you correct. And these things are corrections. The, the denominator is a whole series of things related to the magnetic field. First of all, you have to know absolutely what the magnetic field is. And then you have to be able to know where, what the multipolarity is and versus time. And then you have to know how many muons were there. And then there's two very nasty things in red, which I'll say at the end of the colloquia what those are. But those are little transients which perturb the field just when the muons arrived. It was like a surprise. One of them was a surprise, one of them was known. And this is a beautiful picture where again you see the avocado plot. This is the density of the muons and these are magnetic contours and the folding of the two together give you what you need to know. 
So the master clock, everybody loves this thing, but we're not allowed to touch it. So it's, it's behind some walls and it's many, many times more modules than what you see here. I do a disservice to my Cornell friends who built this entire thing. But we basically have two people not in the collaboration set the frequency of the oscillators by plus or minus about 25 part per million from some nominal thing like that we tell them is our frequency that we wish to run at. And then they write down on these envelopes what, they're, what they are and they check every week. And so I have an envelope, another envelope at Fermilab, and they're all sealed and signed. It's like very secretive stuff. And, uh, and we do the entire analysis in this space called clock tick space. It's almost a second, but it's not quite a second, so to speak. And it doesn't matter because it's not a thing we, we learn from, not, from knowing it correctly or not. Here's the la one of the laser tables. We have a whole laser hot with a laser table. So when we make that, we, when we do this, the only one that capture on this detector stuff is we have to have a gain stability on these detectors, which is practically an order of magnitude beyond what people normally ever do with calorimeters. So more than the 10 to the minus 4 stability as the things change. So we have lasers flashing everything to keep gain control. We have to worry about something called pile, pile, pile up of particles and not because we would confuse signals but because they would be confused by their spin and this is really clever if you have a high energy particle which goes into the wiggle histogram it would decay here and because the positron is high energy it would take a while for it to walk around and hit this detector but if instead two particles of lower energy coll colluded to look like a high energy particle they would have come from a much closer radius because they were lower energy positrons which had a sharper arc. So they had a shortcut. So the, that's fine except the spin of the muon has now changed from here to here and that's a phase shift. You make a phase shift like that you get the wrong answer and that changes early to late in the fill and immediately is a blind pull to the data. So we have to correct that. And we do that like this is an energy spectrum it's a log plot and it's an energy spectrum out to 3 GeV, which is the maximum of the positrons, but it actually goes out here like this, because this is pile up. And once we correct it, it actually goes straight down to here, which is nice. We now have, the correction techniques are many, many. Do it many ways. So once you make a corrected histogram that's supposed to be just single events, then you fit the data to something that any professor would pick, which is a function as simple as this wiggle thing, and you get the wrong answer again because basically there's all of these extra peaks in the Fourier transform. Something else is going on. So you get a lousy chi squared, so you would never publish that, but you also don't kind of get the right answer. And why is that? Well, remember the movie where the particles were moving back and forth early in the talk? They were sloshing around like that. That sloshing around starts to embed itself on the very frequencies that you see in this wiggle plot. And so you have to account for them with terms. That's called coherent betatron oscillations. They have all names. They're all well understood. They're all predictable analytically. So it's not like a surprise, but that's important. And once you do that, you have one more thing, which is occasionally muons can leave the ring. It's called muon losses, because they, they could bounce into something, and then suddenly you have a slow term. So in Fourier transform space, that's stuff that's down here in low frequencies. So you have to account for both of these. And once you do that, then you get a fit that's perfect. You see the chi-squared is equal to 1 here. And these are the residuals, and they're just dead flat with no, with no memory of any frequency or anything else. So that's kind of what has to happen before any data is you know, blessed and allowed to move forward. That's what we're up to right now, is finding, with a much larger data set, we're beginning to find other really odd little beat frequencies that have come in. And they're not important. They don't change the answer, but you've got to get them right. So back to this funny thing that I told you before represents the magnetic field, this omega p tilde, uh, tilde prime of t sub r. So what's the prime? So the prime, the omega p with the prime stands for the proton NMR, but calibrated in terms of the equivalent precession frequency of a proton shielded in a spherical sample of water at 34.7 degrees C, which is Bill Phillips' thesis from decades ago. This was disestablished in metrology, the particular uh, 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 number for the field. The tilde represents the, when you fold in where the muons have been in the convolution. So what we have to do to get this right is basically we have, the, we have to get the field calibration right. That's a step we do with special probes that are listed here. It's a very complicated step that happens at Argonne National Laboratory in a very special custom-built system. 
uh, we have to map the field. I'm going to show you what it's like on the next slide. It's a little bit more fun. So to measure the field moments, by well, moments I see there's the dipole moment, there's the quadrupole moment, there's the, sex, there's the skew quadrupole moment, there's sextable moments, there's a skew uh, sextable moments, and so on. All, so if you think about just defining the shape of the field in terms of that, that's what I, that's what I mean by the word moments of the field. And that's a, in a two-dimensional two-dimensional uh, uh, ring like this, we're going to take a picture. So this trolley, this particular trolley has 17 probes and it goes in the vacuum. So every three days it comes out of a garage, we turn the beam off, and it drives around slowly and it takes images like this. So it takes a snapshot of the, of the beam, I'm not sure if I even get that word out of this mask, but you know the moments of the beam here, and then it moves along and does it like this, and it does thousands of points all the way around the ring. So we then blend that whole, that tube of field together. Now how do we know what happens between the first day and the third day, or the fourth day, or the seventh day? Well, we're running these probes in between time these fixed NMR probes 24-7 and we tie them together so that it, it, here's one day and here's three days later and this is what in run one this is what the dipole field was doing it's actually changing quite a lot and that's because of the temperature we had no temperature control in the first two years of this magnet now we have dead flat temperature control but the HVAC system couldn't keep up as they built this new building we put so much equipment in that even in the dead of the winter of Chicago, you guys never experienced the dead of the winter of Chicago here, have you? Anybody? Never. And you have you experienced the dead of the winter of Chicago? Yeah, not here. But the heat, the heat never came on for a year and a half in that building. That's how that's how much heat we were generating with our electronics. I know. And then eventually this gets put together into this nice picture that you see, and I showed it to you before. So. Back to these little corrections, the beam corrections up at the top here. So there's one, these are well, the first two are totally well known from the last two experiments. This is called the electric field correction. If you, if you had the entire beam sitting in the middle of a quadruple electric field, there would be no correction. It would have the magic momentum and so on. But the, any beam that's off the magic momentum is feeling, the, going through these radial electric fields and you see the little cross product here. And so the, the, the arithmetic adds up to a pretty big correction. This is larger. 489 is larger than the 350 or so or part per billion kind of eventual claim that we have. But we know this pretty well. But nevertheless, we're still working hard on this because this is, we wanted this to be more like 20 and it's 50. And it depends on where the beam is. This is the projection of the beam. So this is the beam. We measure where the beam is in here and that gives us this correction. This is an exaggerated, super exaggerated view of this little pitch thing which we know very, very well. You can see the uncertainty on that is really tiny. And that's just the term that's uh, the fact that we really got a little bit of vertical oscillation. So those two are known. Then we ended up with two surprises. And the surprises, let me, let me just walk you into, uh, uh, for a moment into a little bit of a surprise. It's not too hard. So if, if you had an expression for the number of positrons, n of t, and it has these normal things, this is just the exponential decay, and then 1 plus a cosine omega t plus a phase, this is the, the simple fit, as I called it before. But imagine if this phase, what is this phase? This, what does that mean? That means that is actually representing, at the time the beam comes in, the average angle of the spin of the muons as they start. They, 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 they do a very big, broad range, but there's an, there's an average to that. That's what the fit would find. And that, that fit, that phi zero stands for the time when the oscillation in that wiggle plot is at the top, right? And then, like, so think of it just as the maximum of that for the way we could define it that way anyway. Okay, so what if there was a time dependence to that? If there's a, t a first order time dependence to the phase, to the ensemble average of the spin, then if you work your way through this little Taylor thing, then you could as well put that phase shift here and change the frequency from what you wanted to something that you don't want. And you would never know it. The fit would never pick this up. It's not sensitive to a sliding phase shift. So where could that come from? So the first thing we started to explore, and this was fun, we started to realize, what if the muons that leave the ring, some of them leave the ring, are all of a certain spin type? I mean, there's no reason to believe they would be, but what if they were? And you can get a pretty big shift from that. So we did a very clever campaign to measure that. We measured 
what the dependence was of the spin on momentum and what the dependence of momentum was on loss. And we proved it was really, really small. So we did tons of work on this. It was nothing. But the other one that cost us this year and a half was these stupid resistors, these bad resistors. And this one, I think I have a picture of this. I hope so. No, I don't. I have it in the back. Oh, yeah. It says, ask me about it if you wish at the question time because it's technical, but it's interesting. So you don't have to ask me about it, but it is interesting. But basically, I'll tell you what it is anyway, quickly. So imagine, imagine, imagine this is the circular ring that the muons could decay from. And normally they're in here somewhere, that little avocado. And then they go like that. And if they all stayed about there, that's fine. But remember they moved, the resistors made them move. And it turns out we discovered, and Brookhaven didn't know this, we discovered that depending on where they are, the phase is shifting like mad. So we had to make an entire phase map to understand that if you decayed from there, 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 you would have a completely different place where your wiggle plot would, would, would uh, now it's the same frequency, but the phase would different. You can always add things of different phases that are the same frequency, you're fine. But if they change the population midway through, you have a phase shift. So that was crazy. That's the biggest systematic error. 158 part per billion shift. Now this was really weird. This one, Brookhaven didn't know about this either, but we had really good techniques. That's the thing about having good instrumentation. And this one, this transient basically down here said the following. You saw again where we charged those electric plates up. We charged electric plates up and we found out that they actually vibrate a little. And when they vibrate a little, they created a little magnetic field. In fact, that magnetic field is in blue there and it's going up and down by 400 parts per billion. And that's kind of a lot right when the, right when the beam comes. So it turns out two things were lucky. One is if you blow up, and the time scale of this, by the way, is, is long. This is many milliseconds. But if you blow up right here, this is where the muons are. The muons are in the ring here. And so each one of these, we had to calculate for every one of the fills what the beam was. Sometimes it's getting bigger, little, and so on, the magnetic field. And it almost completely washed out. It ended up being almost nothing. But we had a huge systematic error on it until we could map this entirely. We had to build special equipment to map this. And we've done that now. Now we know it unbelievably well. But we haven't fixed this. And we had to go back and decide whether Brookhaven had this problem. And it turned out that they were really lucky. They, they had data come in at a different rate. And we had data come in where this became a driving frequency. The Fermilab injection of this just happened to be commensurate with this particular mechanical thing. And it's, you know. The other one is just eddy currents. And eddy currents we know and expected. Uh, when you make that big magnetic field, when the beam came in, there's going to be some eddy currents in vacuum chambers and they have to die out. And this has taken us many summers to measure carefully. It's super hard to measure something like a transient field uh, like that. Okay, so in the end of the day, it, what we did was completely statistically driven in run one. And I'll show you, this is kind of a fun thing. This is, this is the total, you know, uh, this is a total error. This is a total systematic error. Um, and then if we look at what happened, these orange things are all the corrections. You can't change the size of the orange bar. You can say, change the size of the uncertainty of the orange bar a little bit. And so one by one, we're, we fixed the resistors, so that'll go away. There's a very subtle problem here with beam bunches that I can't discuss too much right now that we're working on with multiple methods just to produce this one. And this was the one that the quad transient fields, which has this huge uncertainty. It's a small effect, but we've just measured that completely now. So we wiped that out. And these are the goals in the end. So once we got to this point, this arithmetic is done. I show you the error tables. We still are blind. So of course, it's uh, pandemic time. So we're basically unblinding on Zoom. And it looks like this. And this is me opening up an envelope. And this is Chris Polly, spokesperson, opening up an envelope. We compared the envelopes. We ended up with the same numbers on both of our envelopes. We typed the numbers into a spreadsheet. We instantly see the result, boom. And that's essentially this result right here. So this was the Brookhaven measurement. This was our measurement. This is the two average together. This is the standard model. 
And this is now 4.2 standard deviations between the experimental average and the standard model. And these are lots of digits and so on. So, of course, we were extremely, th those of us who were on the Brookhaven experiment are, we were extremely thrilled by the fact that we didn't screw up the Brookhaven experiment. And, you know, and then the Fermilab experiment rescued it and found it out. But after that, let's see what it means. What, where are we going with this now? So you could say, uh, what if it's true, right? What if it's true that this gap is going to be indicative of uh, new physics? So I do recommend, uh, and we talked to some of, the, some of the folks here about this a little bit today, uh, there's a nice literature survey by Dominic Stockinger and a bunch of his collaborators, because he's in our collaboration, so I, I quote him because they, they sort of took a more generic view, because there's really hundreds of suggestions as to what could happen. And there's lots of stuff that's been ruled out since we started to do this experiment. The LHC has not been un, un, unsuccessful. It has been ruling out one thing after another and pushing limits of supersymmetry and so on out of the way. But there's still some ideas that are in here in green with certain spaces in MSSM and certain kinds of uh, uh, leptocork things and so on. I, I, this is a more recent version of a summary and I think it's useful. It says, uh, you know, if you do the constraints, so if you look over what could it be from beyond the standard models that still have the chirality flip that you need, you need some enhancements, you need some mass ranges and so on. In general, without small couplings or large, in large masses, these models can be heavily constrained by collider and dark matter experiments. It's not so easy to find open spaces. This is one example with some lepto quarks that, that work just fine, but it's a, it's a tricky thing. So, so what else? What if it doesn't work out like that? Well, you could say, well, what if the standard model's wrong? Right around the time that we uh, published these numbers, there was a brand new lattice calculation, not experimentally driven calculation of the hadronic vacuum polarization. And here, here again is uh, the white paper number. This is the standard model number here that we're, we're quoting. But over here was the new number that looks a bunch of these lattice calculations. But if you want to be picky and you want to cherry pick or something, you could pick this really precise one that started to come out now that's being looked at and say, well, what if it was over here? Here's the experiment. So this is obviously, crushes those two together. If you push these closer and closer together, then the mass scale is different as well for these beyond the standard model things and so on. And of course the stakes are higher and it'll be another couple decades of two sigma. Before I finish, I just want to acknowledge uh, that in my group, these are all the people that were in my group that, uh, that worked on this experiment. These are, uh, these are all the grad students all along here. So they get top billing because they built everything and did everything in the world. These are the postdocs that are doing lots of stuff, NMR probes and detectors, and this guy's running the operations now. This is a couple faculty, and these are research scientists, again, building so on. Um, this is our group uh, at Elbow when they had a collaboration meeting. And, uh, you know, my, my real thought is, at this point, we know that the Brookhaven experiment doesn't look wrong. We only are looking at about 6% of our data set so far, so we certainly don't want to be too prescriptive about what we're going to get. And uh, it's just a lot of fun to do this kind of stuff. And I want to thank you for coming here and spending an hour with us and appreciate it. And I'm open for any questions you have. Yep. Hey. Yeah, so I'm just interested in, uh, you said you were going to open the box in 2019 and you decided not to. And that, that was triggered by uh, this, this, uh, one of these two. this kind of stuff here, and, so what was the, this uh, thing, this thing is really so hard. So you, had, you, you, you saw that stuff going on and uh, it was bigger than you expected? Or well, you know? it starts like this. You, you start to notice that um, this is the vertical width of the beam and you see that it's going like this across the time when you think you're going to be measuring. You start to get concerned about that. Then you do, you get out all your Monte Carlo models and this took a huge amount of computing time. You basically have to basically run G minus two from every grid square here from, and, and allow, and allow the, the muon to decay into the acceptance of the detectors. It's all an acceptance effect. It's where you are and how they have to arc and how big the detector is. It's a finite detector. If it was, if it was an infinitely large detector, this would go away it's completely, but it's a little detector that can fit in the gap of the magnet. And so this phase shift map 
folds in with this change of where you are. So I have, I've indicated here one and two. So if you decay at position one or two, you have a different phase. That's easy to see. Now if you have a whole ensemble that moves on average toward one, toward two, then you see a phase shift. And that's what's here in this third plot is a phase shift. Now you take that phase shift, and now you know it because you've measured it. And we have lots of ways that we measure this. And you put that into the wiggle fit and you force the answer with that thing and thinks now you get a different answer by having that in there. Well, we have smart people. I would say, I would say the fort <laughs> I'll tell you, the fortuitous one is this one. <laughs> well, the fortuitous one is this one. Uh, this one. And, and this, is, this was set up because our, our folks in the magnetic field business decided they should, they'd like to be able to, NMR, by the way, is sort of millisecond stuff. And this is all happening on microseconds. So how do you measure a field with a millisecond instrument when you, look, when you want to look at around tens of micro, a few tens of microseconds? The answer to that is you do kind of a header down, you time it. So you time it and then they clack like that. And then you, and then you build it up slowly as you sweep through this. So we developed the technique looking for completely different things, like 60 hertz or other, other stuff that the accelerator complex might be throwing at us in time with our beam. And we see this craziness here. You see these things right here. And so pretty soon that started in industry among the people doing it. Then we had to build special devices. This is peak. You have to be able to put an NMR probe inside a pulsing electric field and not blow it up. It would immediately blow up. So we had to develop instruments to do that. And, and eventually we've got trolleys and so on that have mapped that field all over the place. And lots of analytical models. There are lots of people who are out modeling mechanical vibrations and ENM this and that and so on. Nobody has a really good answer for what, it, what drives it. Everybody has a theory. So I was hesitant to say more. This is more fortuitous that we found this one. The other one, the other one was just going, what, what did this beam dynamics thing do to us? We better check. And then there are a few others, but yeah. So, okay, so what I'm seeing here is an awful lot of theory. Which part? Well, the corrections you have. You have ah. Well, and, and I sort of it's sort of a follow on to Mark's question. That it, I'm a theorist, so I get nervous when there's a lot of theory. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, so, and so look, so when you went hunting for these animals. You were using your Brook, I think, using your Brookhaven results plus common sense to kind of hunt them down. Yeah. But do you have any cross check that you haven't missed one? Well, okay, that's a that's a good question, but um, it, we. Yeah, and, and let me just tell you, let me back up and tell you some things about each one. And so this is why for this top, these top C's alone, we have a very long paper published that's called, that talks about all four of those things. And, the, and the, why do we know they're right and what proofs have we done to prove them right? For example, we can do numerical spin tracking programs, which we do, which absolutely accurately give you exactly the same numbers here that we would predict. So we know that measuring this gives you that for the electric field correction, the pitch correction. These are well known. These are very, very well known from many, many decades. There's lots of papers in the literature about these particular beam things. This, this one was one of my worries that I came up with and my grad students uh, and I knocked this out of the park. But this was just, this was more along the lines of your say, what you said, which is kind of like, can you think of a really pathological thing Okay, can you think of a pathological thing that could happen that would change the answer? And this is a pathological thing that could happen that could, if all ducks lined up pathologically, we would have had a 150 part per billion shift. So we created a program where we measured things, you know, where we basically changed the magnetic field of the magnet by plus or minus 0.6%, it's like crazy. And then we could measure exactly the momentum distribution and the spin distribution. Then we did another thing where we only brought in high energy muons and low energy muons, and we watched which ones left the ring at different rates. So we combined all of those together, a beautiful thing that my student did, to show that in the end of the day, it was more like 10 part per billion or five part per billion shift. It wasn't 150, because all of the muons were leaving the ring whether they were one spin or another. There, there wasn't, it didn't care, but it was a, it was a check on pathological things. The, um, 
all the, all the things that we're uncertain about, we're, the uncertainties are greatly exaggerated to encompass any uncertainty at, at all. So for example, the next things in there, like this phase acceptance thing, I can only tell you is a, a year and a, literally a year and a half and 20 people or more working on this particular modeling of this. And that was just because in that, we only had those resistors bad for that runs. But we're still working on it because it's taught us something that we didn't know before. We better understand it even if they're solid resistors. So we're doing a lot more work on that all the same. Uh, the field transients is special teams that have, you know, from our, our magnetic, our atomic physics people have built magnetometers, Faraday magnetometers that go through the thing that measure the rotation of the polarization of the light inside a field. That's what we use. So we have to build those. We have to do those in the summers when there's no beam. We have a lot of work that we do that. Regarding fitting these frequencies, it's, it's almost impossible to get the wrong number. Uh, we could throw out all those fancy terms that makes the chi-squared good. You still get the same frequency. The fundamental fre one thing about measuring frequencies is they're really rugged. And they're pretty independent of all the other things that are going on. They don't, you can get a bad chi-squared and still get the same, same frequency fit. So I think we're pretty good in that. We have a lot of eyes on the problem and we have a lot of skeptics in the collaboration. So that's also useful. Well, Observation is what you know. I mean, I'm telling you things you don't know. But what always gets you yep. is what you didn't think of. <laughs> and you, I, you know, this story uh, looks uh, really good to me uh, from looking from the sidelines because you spent so much time doing it, mm -hmm. hunting down all these animals. And all of the things you found sound like reasonable. It just sounds like a very reasonable story. Yeah, all I can tell you is that when I've been bitten, by things like this in the past, it's always been some damn thing. And we thought we had everything, and we didn't. The, the advantage in numbers here is we really have you know a couple hundred people, and we also have the history that we're about the fifth generation of these things. That doesn't always help you. There's a little groupthink there too, but without groupthink, there's a lot of you know there's a lot of people who would love to be the one in the collaboration and finds that finds that out. You know the attitude is, wouldn't you be the one that wanted to find that out? Yeah. So people. You know, you get a lot of hands up, what ifs. John. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Very, very straight and very clear. Uh, you know, I used to sell resistors at one point in my life. How'd you get bad resistors? We didn't. We made them bad. We, uh, so 28 of them came from the company, per, but they didn't give us all 32 on time. So we had to install something. Four more had to be installed. So how do you make a resistor? You could, you know, if you don't have this one high voltage resistor, you can get like five little ones that add up in series. I remember that from teaching this thing. I can glue them to, you know, you can solder them together. They did this in a tube. When you looked at it, you were horrified. We know, none of us knew this happened. Believe me, none of us knew this. You know, some group that built the quads did that. Thought it made sense. And they, of course, worked in a static situation. You know, it's the fast ramping that you couldn't check that in. It was the dynamic of that that made them uh, some some kind of some discharge happened. Something happened to them. Exactly, and we don't know what it was. And we had, in fact, the only thing we had to do it was really weird when we did this muon loss measurement. That I told them for the systematic, we actually had to go put them back in because we did that a year later and created the same conditions to get the muons to be lost because that made the muons get lost. By the way, right now there's no muon loss correction anymore because the muons don't get lost essentially at all on it, like they did in, the, in run one. They were just. There. there was some other question. Oh, I don't know. No? Oh, maybe not. Sorry. Uh, Leo. Very impressive. Uh, all, all the time and effort and people. Congratulations. Thanks. Um, one thing, two, two things. One is you quoted the magnetic fields and uncertainties in parts per billion, but what was the magnitude of the field that you 1.45 Tesla. And, and they all quoted in Hertz, by the way. Of course, you know, it's a funny translation uh, between, uh, between the field group, but everything's done in, you know, in Hertz. Yeah, and so we've also got not very many measurements, accurate measurements of the electron G minus 2. The electron G minus 2? Yeah. That's known to 0.28 part per trillion. But it's not been measured, you know, measured by Gabriel's and... Correct. Uh, is, does this say anything about 
you know, the other way around even, they, they, they know it you know, thousands of times better. And so if you ask yourself, where do you get the fine structure constant from? Until the fountain experiments of recent years, the fine structure constant literally comes from trusting those Feynman diagrams I showed you earlier with the measurement of g minus 2 of the electron and coming up with alpha. But that, that's known from our point of view way down in digits we don't care about. So he could be wrong by 20 sigma and we wouldn't know it. It wouldn't affect us yet. We're, we're pretty far from that sensitivity. Yeah, so I'm, that's not what I'm saying, but does it say anything about the physics? No, because until, until an independent, and we thought this was true for a while, it was exciting for a little while, when the first uh, fountain measurement came out from Berkeley, it had a deviation of the g minus 2 of the electron in the opposite sign of ours by two standard deviations. And so theorists were quickly coming out, what could make that this sign and us that sign? And then the Paris number came out exactly the opposite, three sigma the other way or so. And so the electron, g minus 2 of the electron was sitting right in between them, if you want. And everyone's just like put their cards down for a while until uh, it gets done uh, better. So we're there in this space of, you know, such high precision, such delicate experiments that something can bounce around quite a bit for them. Yep. To me, it looks like the QCD, you know, last QCD thing seems to be going in the right direction. What did they, what did they change? Did they modify QCD in some way or did they just improve? Calculations. This is just the lattice trying to put that whole problem on the lattice, and that, that's tricky because of, um, I, I, I think it, it's tricky because there's QED involved, which is long distance, and then there's, uh, the, the, the precision that they're aiming at in this calculation, by the way, is half a percent, which isn't normally achievable with lattice, so this is super, like, tour de force calculation. There's some percent in that BMW calculation already. And nobody's achieved that. In the hadronic light by light calculation, which is where a lot of the lattice started for G minus 2, all we ever asked them to do is, can you give us a 10% number, 10, 20%, just prove that those hadronic models aren't nuts that people had used. And then that was before the dispersion calculations came along, which are really good right now. Um, so for that, then people started to figure the hadronic vacuum polarization diagram they could actually do on the lattice and they could get, and I remember somebody sitting in my office telling me years ago they were going to get sub percent. I'm like, really? What? I was jaw dropped at that. And then this showed up. So it's kind of cool. You know, I think it's, I, if you think about the lattice in particle physics, years and years and years of calibration, right? We know the masses of stuff. We know all kinds of stuff the lattice is getting to show us it can get it. And this is one of the most beneficial blind calculations a lattice can make, in my mind. Is you know, you got a, you got all this track record, and now now deliver the number. It's great. So I think it's fantastic. I think they'll get it. I think it's just a matter of you know another couple of years to settle. It's going to take years for us anyway. So it's kind of cool. Going back to I guess Bob's question of unknown unknowns. Uh, no, no, no. Yep. Yeah, we talk about that very phrase. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you, uh, is there anything to be learned to run with the opposite polarity muons? We are going to run in the last year with negative muons. I mentioned this to one or two people. That's the plan. The price of that is that the cross-section for producing negative pions is about a factor two lower for an HEV proton. So that didn't happen at Brookhaven. We could flip it pretty easily. We're going to do it anyway. There's a lot of Lorentz and CPT physics that comes along. We can't think of a single thing that is experimentally on the systematic test other than what I call, you take an experiment like this and you poke it. You know, you, yeah, yeah. you love to do that with your apparatus. You flip all the fields, you fiddle around and turn it on again. And that's the only systematic you're checking is called operational systematic. It doesn't have a name. It doesn't, you're not checking one thing or another. Uh, it, it, so it's, to my mind, I insisted on using the robustness, of, the robustness of the technique as opposed to checking the technique. 
because you're not checking the technique. The technique you believe or you won't be publishing. You know, the technique is, is that way. And how much more data do you need? Also, not only in number of protons, but number of years or minutes. Well, we'll just run one running year there. And in one running year, we'll get four times as much negative muon data as Brookhaven had, which is factor two. So that's OK. We're trying to get 20. 20 times the data set of Brookhaven, and we're, we're about 12 right now, and we're on our way uh, on a slope upward. It's tedious. It's just 24-7, and the, you know, the production team is just, we have many petabytes of data on tape. I, did, I told some people, the raw data rate of this experiment is, is uh, 25 gigabytes per second, per second. And we have, to, we have to filter that down with online. We have farms of... Uh, you, you know, we have farms of processors that are just uh, knocked that down to about 300 megabytes or so a second that we store. It's and funny, actually, you are an accelerator-based experiment, but you accumulate data linearly like a low background experiment. Correct. Right? Completely like that. Order, where, completely you know, right. There is always an order of magnitude more data. Than completely that. correct. It's very strange. It's very much the case that so we have to maintain conditions. So quality control to add up data is a huge team of people that's constantly, you know, sparks. People talk about high voltage sparks. Boom. It, all the time we have to be watching out for little, little trickles of a nonsense like that. So it's tedious. It's super tedious. Okay. So you, you guys are very sweet to come and listen and to a live cloaker. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it a lot.